I probably could have covered this topic earlier, but I wanted you to have an impression of the game before I spoke of the other entries in the series, especially considering how diverse this series is. Yeah. D diverse. Before starting this Let's Play, my exposure to the first game was restricted to a risky click on a random silent playthrough. However, as I was digging for material for the Namco mini-doc, skipping through that playthrough proved just how much of World 2's foundation was built upon World 1. This being Pac-Man's 20th anniversary title, the devs were keen to shake up the conventions of the franchise, making the transition to... 3D platforming? These kinds of terrarium, semi-3D levels are not what I'm accustomed to, even with 3D Land and World making them popular in recent memory. Still, the game should feel familiar after experiencing 2, and it's much longer! After seeing World 1, I would describe this game as being Pac-Man World 1 if it hadn't been limited by its hardware. Do you know why I say that? Well, because we get to see what Pac-Man World 2 looks like limited by its hardware. Did you know that it was released on the Game Boy Advance? World 2 reimagined through the lens of the first game. It's a great pitch, but the GBA dampers what was possible on the PS1. It attempts to fudge an illusion of 3D with sprites, sullying Pac-Man World 2D's legacy with poor depth perception and iffy ledge detection. It also drops the ball on the music, with tracks from the GameCube release placed sporadically throughout the game. Worlds 1 and 2 were handled by, essentially, the same dev team. World 3 was an entirely new team, expected to follow up on the success of the second title. A series that had been developed in-house was now being passed to Blitz Games, a company responsible for such classics as Chicken Run the Game, Bratz Rock Angels, and iCarly. <sighs> These games represent everything I hate about the quality assurance of third-party games. So the question remains, did Pac-Man World 3 live up to the legacy of the previous two installments? Let me put it this way. At some point, I was going to propose that I play through Pac-Man World 3 immediately following the end of 2. I knew that the general consensus was that the game was bad, and my own experience watching Nova backed that up. But I thought I would enjoy poking fun at it, comparing and contrasting the two games. But, <laughs> after recording the first hour of it for this video, that's no longer a consideration, and it's no longer a an offer I'm going to be extending. I don't think I've ever gotten sick to my stomach because I was so disgusted by a video game. Why? Pac-Man is sluggish, and on top of that there's more input lag than when you play Smash Ultimate Online. The camera controls are worse than World 2's. They get stuck on everything, there is no button to center the camera behind you, and you can only look from side to side. The big thing of this game is that you can punch enemies, racking up a combo meter. That sounds exciting, and it certainly would be if there were more than two enemies in the game. I was bombarded with the same fight over and over again. Well, uh, they do try to break up the monotony by adding power-ups designed to make combat more interesting. Th they didn't work. Listen to this music. Now, listen to this music. Uh-oh! I'm detecting a rise in energy in your sector, Pac-Man. Details of my sector's energy should be between me and Miss Pac. Thank you very much. Jokes! There's weird techno stuff here, horse. Yours? Heavens, no! Shoddy craftsmanship like that. It all belongs to Irwin. He's building uh -huh. spectral siphons all over the place. Keep stockpiling raw materials. I'd like you to disrupt, distress, and otherwise blow up anything of his you see. Please. Glitches! Camera! Remember these levels and how each one adds a new mechanic or builds upon a previous one in an inventive manner? For my hour and 20 minute recording session, these were the levels I ran into. 
open world level where you have to wander aimlessly collecting gems to open a door. After a nausea inducing cutscene, the game dropped me in another giant open area. This area is the spectral realm, the plane of existence that the ghosts come from. Sounds cool, right? It would be if they hadn't copy-pasted the same enemy over and over again. Look, recycling enemies is one thing, but preventing the player from progressing until they killed every enemy is not a good idea when you do it seven times in one level with the same enemy. What's worse is when the level itself is just as repetitive. Spend five minutes spawn camping the portals to move on to the next segment, where you have to touch every sonic ring or follow this not very invisible path to move on to the next segment, where you spend five minutes spawn camping more portals, touch more rings, spawn camp more, rings, spawn camp, I get it, you ran out of ideas! Every moment of that recording was a cold reminder that this was the game that killed Pac-Man World. It made my blood boil. Part of the reason why Pac-Man World 2 lives on in obscurity is because of its sequel, because of a development team that followed a recipe and had no idea how to use the individual ingredients of their craft. This game was the one and only time Blitz Games would be handed a beloved gaming franchise to develop under. In 2013, they would announce that they no longer had the revenue to support development. Moving on to become a company called Radiant World, they would continue to flounder, cancelling their first project before being completely bought out by Rebellion Developments. But hey, at least I've been taught a valuable lesson. I now know what Sonic fans have had to deal with for the past... since Sonic 2!